There's an excitement, I know, with you and with me and with the body of Christ because uh, we see things happening that let us know that Jesus is coming again. Yeah, we, we were just in Israel. I know you guys are going yeah. next November. Yeah. Um, How was that trip? I didn't get to ask fantastic. you about it. Really? It was fantastic, yeah. Israel is just, every time you go over there, it's just more beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's just so many things over there. Every time I go, I see something different. But uh, Israel's in danger. They're in grave danger. And of course, Bible prophecy tells us that there's going to be a war, Ezekiel 38 and 39. This is explicit war. has not happened in history. It's about to happen. But the players are Russia, uh, Iran, mm -hmm. Persia, which is ancient Persia, uh, Turkey, uh, Syria, those kinds of nations. Uh, Iran is now boasting publicly and boasting to Israel that they have a hypersonic missile that can strike Israel in 400 seconds. Okay. And so in 400 seconds, they're saying they can destroy Israel. Now, Iran has been saying for decades they're going to destroy Israel. That's right. their eschatology. Mm -hmm. They believe that Allah has called them to destroy Israel and usher in the end times. They have to destroy Israel to usher in the end times. Now, the Iranian people are precious. These, we're talking about the, the government. Right. And so, by the way, 400 seconds is 6.66 minutes. And so they're boasting to Israel, well, first of all, they've been trying to enrich uranium to get a, a nuclear weapon. Right. I believe they already have one or they're very close to having one. Mm -hmm. Benjamin Netanyahu has now become the new prime minister and he is the most hawkish, strong pro-Israel prime minister they have. I was going to ask you, do you think that played into him getting reelected? I do. I really do. Yeah. So you think that's a good thing? It's a very good thing. I, I believe that he, he believes that Jerusalem is the eternal indivisible capital of, of Israel. Mm -hmm. He would never allow Jerusalem to be divided. But uh, the Zechariah chapter 12 and Zechariah chapter 14 both tell us that the issue of Jerusalem uh, is going to be why the world invades Israel. Mm -hmm. They will not give it up. In other words, because Israel will not give up East Jerusalem to the Palestinians, that ultimately is going to cause Armageddon. It's very, it's very explicit in Scripture. And this is what's happening right now. The Biden administration is pressuring Israel tremendously. Uh, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, uh, told Israel this week that if they do anything to, uh, to stop a two-state solution, that the United States will oppose them. Well, a two-state solution means they give up East Jerusalem, they give up the goal, they give up the West Bank, and they give up the goal. Which is very dangerous for America to align itself against Israel in any way. But also, Absolutely. we know that this doesn't work because Israel has tried to do this in the past by giving up land, like for example, That's right. Bethlehem, Gaza. Mm -hmm. Gaza, all these different places, mm -hmm. and it hasn't. Well, it's, ne it's never enough. But how? important is it for America to stand with Israel? And how important is it for our government to do so as well? Well, uh, Joel chapter three is a very explicit scripture about the times we're living in. And God says in those days, and at the same time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I'm gonna enter into judgment with the nations in the Valley of Jehoshaphat for the way that you've treated my people, Israel. You've scattered them around the world and you've divided up my land. So this is God in the first person telling us in the same time period that he restores Judah and Jerusalem, 1948, in that same time period, Armageddon is going to happen. He's going to enter into judgment with the nations because of the way they've treated the Jews and they've divided up his land. The land of Israel belongs to God first. And so, Rachel, you said it exactly right. Land for peace is a disaster. And where are they firing the rockets from? Gaza. Mm -hmm. In 2005, under the Bush administration, we forced Israel out of the Gaza Strip. Five days later, uh, Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast. And the, this book called Eye to Eye by my friend Bill Koenig, he documents 124 instances when there had been historic natural disasters when America was trying to force Israel to give up land. And the most recent was Hurricane Ian. When Hurricane Ian hit Florida, President Biden was giving a speech at the United Nations trying to force Israel into a two-state solution. And so this, this is a disaster. So Israel, America must stand with Israel. Mm -hmm. Because when you're standing with Israel, you're standing with God. And that doesn't mean that God doesn't love the Palestinians and all the Arab people because he does. Of course he does, yeah. It's just Israel is special by covenant. Mm -hmm. And the land of Israel is special because it is a covenanted land that God gave to Israel. You know, America has always historically stood with Israel because they're an arsenal of democracy right. in the Middle East. I mean, essentially, they are standing up to all these Muslim countries. Why do you think this administration is so hostile towards them? Well, beginning with Harry Truman. Harry Truman is the first president that recognized Israel on May 14, 1948, mm -hmm. uh, when they became a nation. Since then, there have been pro-Israel, and every every administration says they're pro-Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and the Biden administration would say that. 
uh, their worldview is not like our worldview. Mm -hmm. Their worldview is that the Palestinians have an equal right to the land. And they think they're being fair. The, wor the United Nations, by the way, the, the United Nations last week right. turned over Israel to the in International Court of Justice at The Hague for their uh, occupying, they say they're occupiers of the West Bank. Mm -hmm. Now we were just in Israel. We drove from Nazareth up to Ramallah, up through the West Bank. Now there are Jewish settlements all the way through there. Mm -hmm. And in this, you know, the, the, the new uh, Netanyahu administration is very, very conservative. And the conserv the, one of the most conservative elements in there, they want even more settlements in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. Well, what, they're, what the United Nations is saying is, we want the International Court of Justice to tell the United Nations how to act against Israel to get them out of the West Bank, to stop all their settlements. By the way, this means 400,000 Israelis lose their homes. Wow. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they take over East Jerusalem, it means 200,000 Israelis lose their homes. This is a big issue. It's not gonna happen under Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. And Benjamin Netanyahu is a great politician. He'll try to make concessions, but he's a very strong pro-Israel uh, prime minister. Mm -hmm. And so I believe we're, we're in for a fight. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible tells us we're in for a fight, and you can see the fight brewing right now internally, but also with the United Nations. And by the way, when it says that the nations of the world attack Israel, that's the United Nations. Mm -hmm. They're doing it right now. And by the way, and this is a good thing, uh, when, the, when the United Nations voted last week to send this issue to the International Court of Justice, America voted against it, Britain voted against it, and Germany voted against wow. it. Wow. And that's a good thing. Wow. We have a little a clip. I just, in fact, interviewed uh, Benjamin Netanyahu while you, yes, were, yes, yes. When you were in Israel. And uh, we're just going to show a little clip of something he had to say. Let's watch this. And the Israeli public clearly wants strong leadership. And mind you, Israel is... Um, um, uh, 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 an island of success uh, and prosperity and security in uh, uh, the otherwise unstable Middle East. But the, the instability in the Middle East is principally a problem of Iran. The, the growing threats from Iran, its quest for nuclear weapons, the uh, terrorist forces and proxies that it sponsors throughout the Middle East. And I've made it my life's mission to prevent Iran from achieving, uh, from getting a nuclear arsenal uh, and fighting its terrorism. Um, uh, every day, and we're successful in that. So you can see that he is right on it as far as understanding the threat of Iran. And I, I don't think the American people really understand what they live under there no. in Israel and that they're surrounded by so many enemies. They're about 600 miles from Tehran, I believe that's right. Very, very close, so, so much so that a hypersonic missile could hit him in 400 seconds. And this is an existential threat. I, I, you know, Israel's a tiny little nation. Right. And so a, a nuclear weapon hits the United States, and so it wipes out Los Angeles, wipes out New York, Washington, D.C. A net nuclear weapon hits them. It's game, set, and match. Yeah. And so they're, they're surrounded by enemies. And see, on the goal, we were on the Golan Heights, this mm -hmm. beautiful Golan Heights that overlooks Syria. So when we were driving our bus into the Galilee area, a fighter jet, an Israeli fighter jet, went right over our bus. Mm -hmm. oh, now, wow. it's probably two or 3,000 feet high, but it felt like it was going right over us. <laughs> and our, our tour guide said they're going to bomb, they're going to bomb Syria. They, uh, so this week, the Israelis bombed the Damascus airport and put it out of service because that's where the Iranians are flying in all their missiles. Mm -hmm. They're flying in there, and Israel keeps warning them, saying, we're not going to let you you know, build uh, an, an armament on our northern border so you can destroy us. Right. And that's exactly what Iran is trying to do. What do you think about all these other international conflicts that are taking place, like Russia and Ukraine yeah. and the pressure that or China, China and, and I mean, just unrest everywhere in the world. Does that play into this conflict as well? Well, Jesus, when they asked Jesus when the end would come, he said there'll be wars and rumors of wars. There'll be earthquakes, famines, pestilences. He said these are the beginning of birth pangs. And so what we're seeing is intense birth pangs. North, North Korea, Iran, Russia. The, the Ukraine is not significant prophetically. They're very precious people, mm -hmm. important to God. It's not, it's, a not, it's not a part necessarily of the Gog and Magog war. But Russia's aggression, see Ezekiel 38 and 39 is addressed to a man named Gog. And he is the leader of Magog. And he's also the leader of all these other uh, allied forces with him that are all Muslim nations, by the way, except for Russia. Well, this Gog is a madman who's trying to destroy Israel and try to, you know, and they're trying to come and take plunder. And so uh, you know, people ask, is Vladimir Putin Gog? Well, he's Gog-esque. If he's not Gog, he's Gog-esque. He's crazy. Yeah. Very, very violent. He's threatening nuclear war every single day against anyone who comes against him. And so I don't believe that the Ukraine war is the beginning of the Ezekiel 38, 39, but here's what I do believe. 
if Israel, and I wrote this, my book Tipping Point, this thing right there, I predicted in the book Tipping Point that Israel would bomb Iran two years ago when that book came out. So I still believe that Israel's gonna bomb Iran. When they do bomb Iran, uh, and by the way, uh, Iran published a couple of weeks ago a video of how they're gonna destroy Israel when Israel strikes them, okay, preemptively. Mm. And so they're gonna come and destroy Israel. So um, I believe that if Israel bombs Iran, I believe that will cause Russia, uh, Turkey, all those nations to converge on Israel. I believe that will be the beginning of the Gog Magog War. And it can happen any time. Yeah. Now, the Israelis know exactly where the Iranians are in their nuclear weapons program. So if they're six months away or a year away or whatever, the Israelis know that. But they bombed Iraq back in, I think it was the 1980s, to keep Iraq because they were building a nuclear reactor and they didn't mm -hmm. trust Saddam Hussein and they bombed him. They will bomb Iran. There's no doubt about it. They can and they will. They put $5 billion in their budget last year to bomb Iran. They had an exercise of all their military with the U.S. military called Chariots of Fire. I believe that was last May. I remember that. Practicing bombing Iran and then defending their borders after they bombed them. Iran knows that they're doing this. They're, they're talking back and forth, you know, through very open channels. And so the point is the rhetoric is heating up. Uh, Iran is getting closer to a nuclear weapon. Now you have Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, Lapid, who is the former prime minister. He was much more dovish yeah. uh, than, than Netanyahu. So thank God we have this wonderful prime minister in Israel right now who is very, very resolved to defend Israel's interest. And there is no doubt about the fact he will bomb Iran when the time comes. Okay, well, I think we have a question from a live caller. John is watching from New York. Jimmy, if you can look straight ahead. John, what's your question for Jimmy? Uh, hello, thank you so much for taking me. Uh, my question is this. Uh, it's my understanding that the children of believers will be raptured up with them. Infants, toddlers, young children that haven't made a decision about Christ yet. The question is, what happens to children of non-believers and atheists? Do they get raptured or do they get stuck with their parents? That, that's a great question, John. Uh, now, when the Bible says something explicitly, I speak with complete authority based on the Bible. When the Bible doesn't say something, I speak based on the character of God and what I believe about God. Um, if you ask the average Christian parent, uh, and you said to them, hey, you're going to get raptured, but your children are not going to get raptured. Uh, they would not be excited. They would be tremendously upset by that. And so I absolutely believe that the children of believers will be raptured. And I believe that's one of the benefits. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7 says that your children are sanctified by your presence, by the presence of a believer in that home. And so I believe one of the benefits of children under the age of accountability is when the rapture happens, they will go because they, they are not of an age of accountability. Yeah. Okay, so what is the age of accountability? I, re, I believe it's around 13 years old. Uh, when a, a boy, remember when Jesus was 12, it said he stayed back at Jerusalem uh, when his parents went back to Nazareth. I don't believe he was being rebellious. He was becoming a man. In his own mind, he was entering into adulthood and he could make his own decisions. And they came back and got him. So I, I believe around the age of 13 is the, the age of accountability. Regarding unbelievers, I believe their children will stay. I believe one of, the, one of the problems with being an unbeliever is your children are not sanctified. Now, it, it could be that I'm wrong and that all children go believers and unbelievers. So I'm stating in my opinion. But I don't believe that uh, people who have rejected Christ have the same covering and the same blessing and the same benefits of those who are believers. Okay. I, you know, I, I, I can disagree with you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I really do believe that all children will go to heaven. Um, I may be wrong about that, but you're right. The Bible's not explicit. Right. And on end times, there's so many different viewpoints That's right. absolutely. on that. But um, we have another question. We're not quite ready. But my question is, Jimmy, what are we looking for right now? Is this your new book, Look Up? This is my new Let's book. Show everybody. Book. Yep. Okay, look up, look your up. redemption draweth nigh. Yeah, Luke 21, 28, Jesus said, when you see all these things begin to happen, look up. Yeah. Because your redemption draws near. So How this can book, people get this book and what's it about? It's, uh, it's, uh, they can pre-order it on Amazon.com. It comes out January 31st. It's about redemption. Oh, it comes out January 31st. Mm -hmm. But it, it's talking about, see, the, the whole issue of redeem means to buy back or to get back. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost their immortal bodies. They lost their minds, their, their redeemed minds. 
they lost everything. So when Jesus comes, we get new bodies, we get new minds, we get our identity back, we get our authority back, we get our intimacy with God back, we get to go back home, we got kicked out of the house, we finally get to go back home, and all of those things. So this, this talks about what is redeemed and how to work through that process in the meantime, waiting for Jesus. Very encouraging book, very educational book, but a very encouraging book uh, to read. Okay, so look up. Um, let's just kind of go through real quickly. I think we've got some more calls to share. But so for people watching right now, Jimmy, where are we at the end of the end of times where we are approaching the rapture of the church? Right. By the way, you know I get emails from people that don't believe there's going to be a rapture of well, the church. And they'll go back to some woman had a dream, blah, blah, blah. But there's no. that's not what you base it on. The early, early church, well, the Bible is explicit that there's a rapture. You know, First Thessalonians chapter 4. Luke 17, uh, Matthew 24, 1 Corinthians 15, Revelation 4. There are many explicit texts about the rapture. And so the, the whole uh, concept that this is a recent teaching is completely false. Right. And so there's going to be a rapture, and I believe it could happen anytime. And then after the rapture of the church, what happens? The seven-year tribulation? All hell breaks loose. And the Antichrist will appear. Was it the wrath? What, what, do, we, what do you say? It, the, it's the wrath. It's the wrath of the Lamb. It's the, yeah, the, I'm, not, I'm not taking your name in vain. It's <laughs> the, the wrath of the Lamb. Yeah, Revelation yeah. chapter 6 calls the uh, tribulation the wrath of the Lamb. Now, isn't that a crazy way to say it? This little precious Lamb. But see, Jesus is in spit on, slapped, rejected, crucified. And he's taken it, taken it, taken it, taken it, taken it, and done nothing but give grace to humanity and patiently waited for them to turn. When the tribulation comes, the lamb will have his seven years of wrath on the earth. You can still get saved, but you will go through a, a horrible time during, during that period. But, but the point is, you, you were talking earlier about a timeline, Joni, and it's interesting. In 1948, the end began. On May 14th of 1948, according to Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 66, that's the day when Israel was reborn as a nation, that started the clock. In 1967 is when uh, Jerusalem was regathered. In 1989 is when the Jews began to come back, according to Jeremiah 31, they began to come back from Russia, the land of the north. And so then in about the year 2000, it says in Daniel 12, Daniel sealed this book up because Daniel is a very prophetic book. To seal it up until the time of the end and you'll know the end has come because many people will go to and fro and knowledge will increase. In other words, when the end comes, there'll be an increase in travel and knowledge. In the last 20 years, we have seen an absolute explosion of knowledge since dot-com came out, the internet, all those kind of things, smartphones. Now we have artificial intelligence. And so I believe that we're current in the sense that uh, we're seeing an outpouring of knowledge and travel, people going to outer space, private citizens are paying to go to outer space. Yeah. And so the other thing I would say is this, what brings us mostly current is the anti-Semitism in the world today. Now, the anti-Semitism right now, this is an article in the Jerusalem Post. Mm -hmm. The anti-Semitism today is, is as bad as it's been since the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And so in the 1930s, this is before the Holocaust, uh, there were over 9 million Jews in Europe uh, before the Holocaust. Now there's about 1.4 million in Europe. And so the, they're fleeing to Israel. They're fleeing to the United States. But even the United States now... There's a rise in anti-Semitism on college campuses. There's a rise in anti-Semitism in the media. Kanye West and people like that have made very provocative statements that are anti-Jewish. And this is what I say about anti-Semitism. First of all, it's a spirit. There is a spirit of anti-Semitism that comes that's yeah. against the Jews. And the Antichrist, the, the spirit of the Antichrist is all over the world right now. We have um, someone from Georgia, I believe it's Latasha. Uh, how are you doing today? And what's your question for Jimmy? I am doing great, and it's a pleasure to speak with y'all. God bless y'all. My question for you, Pastor Jimmy Evan, is in the Word of God, it says Jesus would say to the people, i never known you. And I would like to know why would he say to the people, i never known you, when the people would say, I, you know, like cast out devils in your name. Could you explain to me you know, the about, meaning of that scripture? Well, there's two scriptures you're talking about. Matthew 7 is where Jesus said, beware of false prophets. You'll know them by their fruits. For many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, you know, we cast out demons in your name. We did miracles in your name. We prophesied in your name. And Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
And he says there that we'll know a prophet by their fruit because grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles. What he's talking about there is a person's character. When you, when you know Jesus, it changes. You're full of love. You're full of joy. You're full of peace with other people. But there are people who say there are Christians that are just mean as a junkyard dog. I've been a pastor for 40 years, and I believe that 98% of Christians are the sweetest people in the world. 2% are not. And there are people who are just flat mean and just mean-spirited. And I think if you're mean, this is what Jesus is saying in, in Matthew 7, is if you have a mean spirit, uh, you need to be careful because grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes. The nature of Jesus, if you know Jesus, you're going to have his nature inside of you. If you're mean-spirited, that's not Jesus. He's giving a warning there to people. Now, in Matthew 25, this is when Jesus says, I never knew you. So this is the ten virgins. Uh, in Matthew 24 is all about the end times. The, yeah. the disciples ask him, when's the end going to come? Jesus gave all the details about when he was going to come in Matthew 24. In Matthew 25, he tells two parables in a true story about how he's going to judge everybody when he comes. The first parable he tells is the parable of the virgins. There were 10 virgins. The virgins all identify with the bridegroom. They all say, hey, we know this bridegroom. We're getting ready to marry this bridegroom. It says, but when the bridegroom came, there were five virgins ready with their lamps trimmed, and there were five virgins who were not ready, who did not have oil in their lamps. Okay, so this is important because in a Jewish wedding, the bride had to sleep in her bridal gown. She had to have a lamp lit because the groom normally came at midnight and she didn't know when he was going to come. So she had to be ready at all times. So five of these virgins were ready with oil in their lamps. Five were not ready. When the bridegroom came, when the announcement came, the bridegroom is coming, the foolish virgins turned to the wise virgins and said, let us borrow some of your oil. See, I can loan you a lot of things, but I can't loan you my relationship with Jesus. Yeah. See, the foolish virgins did not have, they didn't spend their time getting to know the bridegroom and, and preparing for it. So when the bridegroom came, the wise virgins went into the wedding. When the foolish virgins showed up after they went to get oil, they knocked on the door, the bridegroom opened the door and he said, depart from you, me, I never knew you. And so here's the point. The way to heaven is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not being a member of a church, though that's, that's right. important. That's right. It's not knowing other Christians, though that is important. The only way to heaven is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so in that parable of burden, this is the troubling thing about that, Natasha, that scripture. According to Jesus, when he returns, half the church will be false. So I just believe that if you know Jesus, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus, you bear the nature of Jesus, you believe in his word, I believe that he's going to come, he's going to rapture you. But you can say you're a Christian, but, but saying you're a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. It's a personal relationship that does. That's why Jesus said he never knew them. All right. And, um, Wow, that's a very good answer. Thank you for your question, Latasha. Would you just right now, uh, Joe, as you begin to play, give people an opportunity to pray the sinner's prayer. You know, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life, and no one coming to the Father except by me. He made provision through, for us through the cross, dying on the cross for our sins. And some of you don't know if the rapture would take place, if you would be ready to meet the Lord. I had a dear friend of mine call me from California and say, Joni, will you please tell people that they don't want to wait until the rapture of the church and be here for the tribulation period to get saved because most likely they won't get saved, right. okay? Right. So you want to be ready today and you need to make sure you're ready to meet the Lord now. So would you lead us in a prayer, Rachel? I'll repeat after you, Jimmy. Just pray with me if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, open my heart to you. I open my heart to you. And I invite you to come in. And I invite you to come in. To be my Lord and Savior. To be my Lord and Savior. I confess my sins to you. I confess my sins to you. And pray for your forgiveness. And pray for your forgiveness. Give me the gift of eternal life. Give me the gift of eternal life. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the power. Give me the power. To change. To change. And to live for you. And to live for you. I dedicate the rest of my life to you. I dedicate the rest of my life to you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer today, everything's going to change. Everything will change because you're now a new creature in Christ Jesus and old things have passed away. And you know, whatever mistakes you've made, they're under the blood or they're washed really away by the blood of Jesus. So let us know if you prayed that prayer. Call that number on the screen. You can go to daystar.com, click on prayer and say, hey, I prayed that prayer. We want to send you a free book entitled, Now What? We have it in English and in Spanish. 
So let us know. Jimmy, it's important to tell somebody, don't you think? You need, you need to go to church. You need to be water baptized. Yes, yes. You need to tell somebody. If you, the, when Jesus called people to follow him, he called them publicly. There's no a private Christian is a dangerous thing. We want to be public about our faith, not obnoxious, not self-righteous. Right. We want to be proud of Jesus. Amen. And tell people it's very powerful. Okay. Rebecca Lamb Weiss has a question. Hey, I do have a question. This is actually something I think about personally, which is what is going to be happening during the thousand year reign of Christ and what are believers specifically going to be doing during that time? Great question, Rebecca. Well, so Jesus told in the Gospel of Luke, he told the parable of the Minas. And remember, it says that we rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. In Luke, yeah. in uh, Revelation 20, it says, the dead came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand and years. And Satan will be bound a thousand years. That's exactly right. What a wonderful time that's going to be. <laughs> yeah. The earth is going to be at rest wow. under the lordship of Jesus. No elections. No one has to be like Jesus is the king for a thousand years. But we will rule and reign with him. Now, in, this, in the parable of the Minas that Jesus teaches, he says he, this master goes away, gives Minas to his servants. They serve him. He comes back and calls his servants into account. And the servant says, here, master, you gave me 10 Minas. Your 10 Minas made 10 more Minas. And the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you've been faithful with 10 Minas, I'm going to make you ruler over 10 cities. Yes. So I do not believe that the millennium is a time for believers just to be sitting around, even though we'll have new bodies, we'll be perfected in our new bodies. I believe that we rule and reign with Jesus. And so I believe that the way we live our lives here, remember, Revelation 20, Jesus said, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to each man according to his works. We're saved by grace, but we're judged by our works. And I believe that based on how we've lived our lives on this earth, we have geographical authority on the earth during the millennium to rule and reign with him. So one person might be, you know, uh, uh, over a neighborhood. Another person might be over a town or a city. Another person may be over a state, you know, or over a country. And so I believe that it's going to be exhilarating. Think about this. The believers will rule the earth for a thousand years. They're no lip. And by the way, this is a rod of iron rule. This is not an age of grace. The age of grace ends... In Revelation 19, with the second coming of Jesus Christ, the millennial reign of Christ, we're in our perfected bodies. We never sin again for all of eternity. But there are mortals on the earth, and we, we reign over them. Jesus, through Jesus' authority, we reign over them. And I believe that for the thousand years, it's going to be this incredible time of the world resting under the authority of Jesus and His church. I think it's going to be an incredible time. Uh, it, it's like this. Some people think that the rapture is a reset and just everything goes away. The, everything continues. Everything we've done in this life, the bad is forgiven, it's under the blood, but everything you've done in this life follows you into eternity and into the millennium. And I believe for those who have served Jesus, I'm talking about being serving in the nursery at church. I'm talking about serving at the parking lot in church. I'm talking about baking cookies for a, for a bake sale at church. I'm talking about however you've helped. Visiting the prison. The, the going to the prisons, however you've helped the work of gospel, yeah. you can't even comprehend how that compounds into eternity. That's so good. I wanted to mention, we were talking about like signs of the time. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, this is crazy. The world's first artificial womb facility is a creepy glimpse of pregnancy in the future. And um, it was the brainchild of a biotechnologist from Berlin. His facilities would allow couples to conceive babies and be true biological parents. They could get the elite package, which would let you engineer the embryo genetically before they implant into an artificial womb. You can choose intelligence, height, strength, hair, eye color, and avoid genetic diseases. Hashem, who is the the scientist, says ectolife is entirely powered by renewable energy and is the first artificial womb facility in the world. How crazy is that? I think, I know I'm going to show the picture. We've got a picture of what it will look like. This is not an actual, um, but this is just, that's showing, that's what they're, they're saying it would look like. Now, those are not Actually, and they can right. do up to what thirty thousand babies. That hasn't happened yet, but what in the world? I mean, think about the ramifications of that. We just announced Rachel's pregnant, of how God designed us, and what a baby gets from being inside a mother's exactly. womb. Yeah. And to, like, just speak to that, Jimmy. Is that insane? Well, in Genesis eleven, when they were building the Tower of Babel, it says they wanted to make a name for themselves. 
Okay, so this is the problem. That's Lucifer in Isaiah 11, Ezekiel 28. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make a name for himself. It wasn't enough to serve God. It wasn't enough to worship God. Yeah. He wanted to stand out. And so they were trying to make a name for themselves. And God came down and he made a very, very terrifying statement. And God said, because they're one, nothing that they propose to do will be impossible to them. Because they're one. That's why he scattered them around the world. Mm -hmm. So we're made in the image of God. We have to realize we're, we're incredible. We're going to marry Jesus Christ. Yeah. Sometimes I don't think we understand who we are. Humanity has unlimited potential. And so this will happen. If Jesus tarries, remember Jesus said, unless those days had been cut short, no flesh would have survived. Yeah. So mankind only has the ability to do all these incredible things. We also have the ability to destroy ourselves. And so technology is racing forward on two fronts. One is this type of thing where they're going to be able to make designer babies. They'll be able to do this. Okay. Wow. The other thing is nuclear weapons and all the ways that we're going to destroy ourselves. And so we know that Jesus returns, and that's the only thing that keeps you know mankind from extinction. However, this type of thing, if Jesus tarries 100 years, which I don't believe he will, you'll see this. Uh, you'll see. Now, there's nothing wrong with technology helping people have babies. There's something with technology making us God. Yeah. And what this is saying is we're not trusting you for the sex. We're not trusting you for the eye color. We're not trusting you for the genetics. We're going to take over ourselves and we're going to, we're going to make our own babies. And so I, I believe what God said in Genesis 11, if Jesus tarries, it will be true that yeah. nothing that we propose to do will be impossible for I us, also, but we will become God. I also think it's a slippery slope when you start trying to control genetics and it's like the future of AI comes in and it's like genetically modified humans and it's like the superhumans. Well, it's all it's, happening. I mean, everything you just said, transhumanism has already taken place. Well, look, look at Elon Musk. Elon Musk, this, this uh, Neuralink, by the chip that they have for the brains, he's saying he wants to help people with Parkinson's disease, not people who are paralyzed. Beautiful. I think that's wonderful. He's also saying that they want to put this chip in the brains of children, link them up to the cloud so that they can learn at an exponentially higher rate. And there will then be a period of time if your children go to school and they're not chipped that they won't be accepted, that they'll actually be subhuman and won't be able to learn at the pace of other people. So they're trying to integrate uh, this whole transhumanism movement. They're trying to integrate technology into our bodies to enhance us. In other words, God didn't do good enough. See, in the Old Testament, there were the Nephilim, the giants, when the angels came down and mated with human women and nine feet tall, 10 feet tall people. Like what's, Goliath. What's the, like Goliath. What mm -hmm. Satan was saying is, God, you make them six feet tall, I'll make them nine feet tall. I can do better than you. Yeah. That's the same spirit of what's happening in the world right now. We, we, can, be, we can be immortal. We can uh, cure all of our diseases, all those types of things. And Jesus is going to come. It's not going to happen. But you see the spirit of arrogance yeah. in humanity today saying we can become our own God. I can tell if I'm, I, God didn't, God's not going to tell me whether I'm a man or a woman. I'll tell myself whether I'm a man or a woman. God's right. not going to tell me how to live my life morally. I'll tell my life, myself how to live my life morally. And the point is, that's when you have become God and you have cast God out of your life. And that is the spirit of the Antichrist, by the way. Okay, well, I did want to mention your book. For those of you that like to read more about this, of course, your book came out, Tipping Point. It's one of the best books you've done. Yes. <clears throat> it, Quickly. Give it, it's just a primer <laughs> on the end times. If you want to understand what the Bible says about the end of times, that's, that's a very good comprehensive book. Okay, so Tipping Point. And then this is a little book you did <clears throat> for unbelievers and for people uh, who were left behind. Well, the number one question the minute after the rapture happens is, where are the missing people? Where are the missing when people? Around a billion people are missing. And so this book answers that question for people who are left behind. So you can leave it in your home, by your bed, in your car, office, apartment. And what that does is people can see that uh, there and pick it up. It will lead them to Christ and help them to understand what's about to happen in the world. And then your new book, it'll be out in a few weeks. In a few weeks. Uh, yeah. You can pre-order it on Amazon.com. Look up. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, look up. Your redemption draws near. So this t talks about what you're about to get back. Why, why, should we, why should we look up and think about our redemption? That's what Jesus told us to do. It's because when you understand what you're about to get back, what you've lost, a lot of people don't even understand how much we've lost. Mm -hmm. When you understand what you're about to get back when the rapture happens, it's exhilarating. It'll encourage you. And I want to say that we, we talk about all this, but I know Jimmy believes and I believe we occupy until he comes. That's right. You wouldn't be building a building if you thought he was, you know, I mean, you're not like saving your food and hiding. You're, we're continuing to preach the gospel. We're continuing to reach out around the world. God's opening supernatural doors for Daystar. You let the Lord use you in this time and season. He wants to do that. <laughs>